For Comedy Hype News, I'm Ramil Thompson. The Boondocks is an animated comedy series that's no stranger to controversy and stirring up conversation. From episodes that depict Martin Luther King telling other black folks to shut up to its commentary on Tyler Perry, The Boondocks was a show that never took its foot off the gas. The series is known for its parody and satirization of real life figures and events. In addition to skewering Martin Luther King and Tyler Perry like I mentioned earlier, the show has also poked fun at R. Kelly, BET, Oprah, and several other black figures and cultural events. The show has also brought several unknown figures to the forefront, one of them being a white country singer who makes music based off his displeasure with black people. That singer was named Jimmy Rebel, and he was based off a man, Johnny Rebel, who would make white segregationist music. Here's the story behind the real life Johnny Rebel. The story of Jimmy Rebel aired in the third season of The Boondocks, and the episode follows Uncle Ruckus meeting his musical idol, racist country singer Jimmy Rebel, based off real life singer, songwriter, and musician Johnny Rebel. Back in the late 60s and 70s, Johnny Rebel would sing and release songs that were rooted in white supremacy, often expressing its support for racial segregation, the Ku Klux Klan, and the Confederacy. Johnny Rebel's first and only original album was called For Segregationist Only, released in 1971. Two more albums, The Complete Johnny Rebel Collection and It's The Attitude Stupid, were released in 2003. Now, the episode stars Jimmy Rebel, a clear parody of the real life Johnny Rebel. In the Boondocks universe, Jimmy is known for his records like Welfare Queen and Cadillac King, I Almost NAACP'd Myself, Black Toes and Ghettos, Those Crack Babies, and many more offensive songs. These are song parodies, but they're not too far off from Johnny Rebel's music that was released in the world. Johnny's songs include Looking for a Handout, Cajun Ku Klux Klan, In Coontown, and many other offensive titles. The real life Johnny Rebel was born Clifford Joseph Trahan in September 1938 in Moss Bluff, Louisiana, a town about two hours west of Baton Rouge. Trahan's interest in music began around the age of 12 when he was gifted his first guitar. After graduating high school, Trahan became friends with record producer J.D. Miller, who helped him with his music and songwriting. Trahan originally recorded his country songs under the name Tommy Todd. Music under that alias didn't amount to much, but luckily for Tommy Todd, Miller was able to get a new record company, Todd Records, interested in Tommy Todd's music. This led to Tommy Todd moving to Nashville in order to further his career. Unfortunately, Todd records wouldn't amount to much and the label would go extinct in 1964. Just like that, Tommy Todd's musical aspirations dried up. As a result, he got married, moved to Mississippi, and picked up work as a shipyard inspector. Back home, J.D. Miller founded Reb Rebel Records, which specialized in recording segregationist music. Miller convinced him to begin recording new songs, to which Todd agreed, making music under the name Johnny Rebel. The name Johnny Reb has an historical background which represents the national personification of the common soldier of the Confederacy. Johnny Reb has been used as a nickname for veteran Confederate soldiers as well as a way to refer to white natives that formerly belonged to the Confederacy. Johnny Rebel obviously takes his name from Johnny Reb, an alias that Miller came up with. In 1966, Reb Rebel released their first record, Dear Mr. President by Happy Fats, which sold over 200,000 copies. The song made fun of the civil rights programs supported by then president Lyndon B. Johnson. In a 2003 interview for Gambit, Rebel revealed his thoughts when Miller first asked him to record segregationist music under this new label. I said, I don't know. I'll take it home and throw it around. I did and then we got into recording. Never was it ever in my idea that I was going to write these types of songs and I was just writing them off the feeling of the time. Common subjects were the laziness of black people and how blacks and whites were supposed to be kept separate. It wasn't like, I'm gonna jump up today and write about blacks. In them days, that just seemed like the natural thing to do. Well, hell, we did it. I did it. He didn't entice me in any way, and he didn't try to influence me in any way. All the songs I wrote were my complete ideas. My ideas, when I got them done, I brought them to him, and he said, let's put them down. Obviously, Uncle Ruckus is influenced by Jimmy Rebel's artistry, and he's inspired to make his own racist song, Keep Those N****. Out of NASCAR. Jimmy and several other music executives like what Ruckus had sent them, which causes Jimmy to pay a trip to Woodcrest to meet the man who created this song. There's only one problem. 
Uncle Ruckus is black. When Jimmy Rubble and Uncle Ruckus meet for the first time, Jimmy is thrown off that a black man likes his music. Ruckus ends up lying to Jimmy and telling him that he's not Uncle Ruckus, but instead his assistant named Toby. The two develop a bond and form a friendship over the racist messages pushed through through Rebel's music. Eventually, Uncle Ruckus is forced to come clean and tell Rebel that he is the real Uncle Ruckus. In response, Rebel invites him back to his hometown and suggests that the two record an album together, much to the shock of all the employees at Racist Records, who are not only surprised to see a black man in their offices, but also shocked to see a black man sing about how much he hates black people. Rebel stands by Uncle Ruckus, and to prove this, he invites him to a concert so the two can perform their newly recorded song together. When Rebel brings Uncle Ruckus on stage, the crowd is appalled that he would collaborate with a black man. Get that off the stage. A riot breaks out because of this and the two barely escape. It's here where Jimmy Rebel confesses his true thoughts on rednecks and racism to Uncle Ruckus. You're just like one of us, Ruckus, but they still hate you. And it's not your attitude, it's cause you're black. And know what else I realized? Most rednecks are really stupid. When asked why he participated in white segregationist music, Trahan said, they asked me to do it. Hell, I did it. I would do anything to make a buck. Hell, I made a few bucks off of it. Even with all the controversy, Trahan insists that he didn't intend to start trouble or spread hate. I don't care about black. Black don't rub off. There is not a black in this country that has to be black. There's not a white that has to be white. They just came here like that. They were born that way, but they didn't develop the damn attitude. Whites didn't develop that attitude. Blacks develop an attitude towards the whites and they won't let it go. They won't let go of what happened. In the end of the episode, Jimmy Rebel tells Ruckus that he wants to make more music with him, but he declines because this causes him to realize that Jimmy Rebel wasn't the racist Uncle Ruckus thought he was. While the real life Johnny Rebel claims he doesn't harbor any racist feelings towards black people, just like the boondocks Jimmy Rebel, his contributions to racist ideologies and empowerment of white supremacists makes him just as guilty and it cannot be excused. Trahan insists that he was just singing what was on the minds of everyone he knew. At that time, there was a lot of resentment whites towards blacks and black towards whites. So, everybody had their own feelings. Lots of people changed their feelings over the years. I basically changed my feelings over the years up to a point. At the end of the episode, Jimmy finds Uncle Ruckus and the two end up making music together, but instead of bonding over their hatred for black people, their new targets are Mexicans. Trahan died in Rain, Louisiana on September 3rd, 2016 at the age of 77 from unspecified causes. As of November 2022, the episode is not available on any streaming service. Back in 2020, a representative from Adult Swim spoke to the Daily Beast where they would confirm that the episode had been banned due to racial and cultural sensitivities. When Adult Swim transitions series to a new platform, we determine what episodes are selected through creative and cultural filters and our standards and practices and policies. Oftentimes, these decisions are made in collaboration with the show's creators. It's unclear if HBO Max made this decision in collaboration with series creator Aaron McGruder, but due to McGruder's unapologetic style, we doubt he had a hand in banning the episode. These episodes being removed came at a time where the country was in a state of civil unrest. Networks began removing episodes of 30 Rock, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, The Golden Girls, and several others. Disclaimers were put up before the film Gone with the Wind and several Looney Tunes episodes. The Boondocks was also affected by the removal of potentially offensive and insensitive themes. What do you guys think? Do you agree with the removal of these offensive episodes? Just because they were removed doesn't mean they never existed. Do you think removing these episodes was the right thing to do? Let us know in the comments below. Stay up to date with the latest news and comedy by subscribing here to our YouTube channel, follow Comedy Hype across all social media, and look out for original content on our new streaming service. For Comedy Hype News, I'm Ramil Thompson.